And this afternoon we're going to begin with the afternoon's keynote address by uh, uh, Richard Offsheet. Richard? Thank you, and um, before I start, I'm sure a substantial part of your um, kind welcome uh, is because at least some of you have read Making Monsters, and insofar as <laughs> and inso insofar as you indicate any appreciation for that book. I think it's appropriate, otherwise I will feel like a thief, to acknowledge my co-author and friend and full collaborator, to say the least, on Making Monsters, Ethan Waters. Ethan. <laughs> and now I'll try to figure out something to say for the next 45 minutes. I thought perhaps the way to start would be to try to figure out what the subject is that we are talking about at this conference. The name, Recovered Memory Therapy, seems to be the subject. And I think it's important that we define that in some way. And I can tell you what my study of this subject has led me to choose to define these words to mean this is what I understand them to mean. The word recovered or recovery, insofar as it's used in recovered memory therapy, has nothing to do with recovery or healing. It has to do not with the production of recovery, but with the personal and social destruction and all too often the suicide of patients who are unfortunate enough to fall into this process. I can recall with some degree of clarity reading a paper a year or two ago. I don't remember who wrote it, but it was a paper written by a recovered memory therapist reporting on the suicides of five of his patients. For someone who has studied this process, one could not help but read such a paper as a confession. Memory has little or nothing to do with this subject matter. Memory, as used in recovered memory therapy, has nothing to do with human memory as we understand it, but rather has to do with the misidentification of newly created beliefs as memories. Therapy what happens in the treatment of people in recovered memory therapy is hardly therapy, but rather when it is actually studied step by step, event by event, it is the unconscionable mistreatment of patients, if not their utter brutalization. I've said before, and I will repeat, if for, only, if for no other reason than to make sure that my claim to having first articulated this is well recorded, so I can either be proven right or wrong, recovered memory therapy is the psychiatric, psychological quackery of the 20th century. In order to analyze 
and to understand this phenomenon, we really need to pay attention to two prongs. It is, as the lawyers would say, a two-pronged analysis. The first prong has to do with human memory. Here the question must be clearly drawn because to fail to do so misdirects the search for understanding. Recovered memory therapy depends upon, it proposes the existence of, a very specific mental mechanism with properties that distinguish this mental mechanism from all recognized forms of forgetting and remembering and psychological and organic amnesia. It is a mechanism that supposedly permits a person to live for a decade or longer under the most abysmal conditions and to be ignorant of this fact literally while it is ongoing or to become ignorant of it after this period in their life has concluded. And that ignorance is of a very special kind. It is a powerful sort of ignorance because the person is argued, hypothecated, to be unable to recall that she or he was raped literally the day it happened, if not the next day, no matter how often this event goes on. Or the person may live for years involved in a world in which their victimization is intertwined with every other event of their lives. Those people who come to believe, and they sincerely believe, that they were victimized by satanic cults for 5, 10, 15 years of their lives, relate, as their narratives develop, an account of a life in which victimization by the cult is intertwined with every other recollection that they have of their lives. And because of the operation of this very special mental mechanism, somehow, magically, often because the cult supposedly possesses the technology to, on instruction, make them become ignorant of this, somehow, magically, they become ignorant of it in the same way that the person who is ignorant the morning after a rape has become ignorant of it, even if the, the evening happens a thousand times and they are ignorant each morning when they are awake. It is sort of like Groundhog Day written by Stephen King. <laughs> this mental mechanism, which we have labeled robust repression, or which John Briere calls total amnesia, or others identify as some sort of special wrinkle of dissociation, either exists or it does not. For the analysis of the memory prong of the recovered memory epidemic, only one question needs to be answered. And that question is, what credible evidence is there that this mechanism exists? If the answer is none, we need not consider the memory issue further. The answer is simply that no scientific evidence from any source, whether it's laboratory, field, human experience, from any source, suggests that this mental mechanism exists. That is all that really needs to be said about the memory question 
when it comes to understanding recovered memory therapy. The ideas talked about this morning, while extremely interesting, and I learned a great deal about the biology of human memory, relate to how memory really works. None of it suggests that this magical mechanism exists. And this mechanism must exist if recovered memory is to be valid. We need not go further, because with the lack of substantiation for this mechanism, there is no scientific basis for recovered memory in any of its articulations. Whether it has to do with coming to believe that one has been sexually brutalized and victimized by one's family, whether it has to do with believing that one has been victimized by a satanic cult, or whether it has to do with believing that one is a multiple personality, none of it is possible if robust repression does not exist. And it does not, as far as anyone who is willing to base their opinion on the scientific evidence can possibly say. To say anything else is wild speculation, is laughable, and if one is a practitioner, is an abdication of one's fundamental obligation to protect one's patients. It is reckless, it is dangerous, it is hurtful, it is wrong. If we look at the other side, the second prong, the second prong has to do with the affirmative understanding of where these sincerely held beliefs come from. We turn to the influence side. And on the influence side, the issue is entirely opposite. There is vast, well-founded scientific evidence showing that it is not only possible to create beliefs in complex life histories that need have no relation to reality whatsoever, but it can be demonstrated over and over and over again. The simplest demonstration is to point to the existence of the other two kinds of recovered memory therapy. We here are addressing only one of the three varieties of recovered memory therapy. That part that deals with the incompetent creation of beliefs in childhood victimization held out of a person's awareness. The other kinds have to do with leading people to come to believe that they suffered trauma, not in their childhoods, but on spaceships circling the Earth with E.T.'s evil brother. Space alien kidnap recovered memory therapy. Capitalizing on the same sorts of influence procedures that have affected your children. And the third kind, the kind of recovered memory therapy that focuses on forming beliefs that one is regaining access to information about trauma, death trauma, sexual abuse trauma that happened in past lives. These are the other two kinds of recovered memory therapy. When we mention space alien kidnap recovered memory therapy, or past life recovered memory therapy, people tend to roll their eyes, people tend to snicker, 
they tend to go elsewhere, they tend not to take it seriously. Perhaps part of the reason that we can afford as a society not to take it that seriously is that the cost of doing that is de minimis compared to the cost of not taking recovered memory therapy focused upon childhood trauma belief formation seriously. The cost of not taking this seriously to American society and spreading to the rest of the English speaking world is enormous. It is enormous both in terms of the harm done to the people who are victimized by these therapists, but it is also enormous in terms of the simple dollars spent on this problem. No one knows how many hundreds of millions of health care dollars are being not only wasted in American society today, but used to inflict pain on people. If we knew the billing totals that are generated by dissociative disorder units just in hospitals in the United States, I suspect the total, and, even, and if we could break it down only to that part of it that has to do with dissociative identity disorder, the new retreat name for multiple personality disorder, even if we knew the, that part of the billing in dissociative disorder units attributable to just that phenomena, I suspect we would be in the hundreds of millions of health care dollars wasted. I can only look at the cases I review and get some idea that $2.75 million spent for the treatment of one family is the single largest number that I have seen. But I have seen other case files that, in, that report $2 million, a $1 million is by no means unusual. We are talking about a vast amount of money being used to create the suffering that your children and you are undergoing. Unlike the vagaries and miseries of life that cannot be avoided, the accidents that kill people and maim them, the illnesses from which people we care about suffer, recovered memory therapy is 100% avoidable. It, like lobotomy, need not happen. Should never have happened and should be stopped. When we turn to the influence side, we see so clearly and easily what is going on. It is the understanding that arises from my entire career that makes me seem so certain. I recognize that I may be wrong. That is a possibility. It is a possibility as is the possibility of robust repression. I'm betting that I'm right because the likelihood of robust repression being real is so small. Recognizing that I may be wrong, I still feel no reservation in feeling certain that I understand how this process works partly because of the experience of my professional career studying influence, learning about the thousands of studies done by other social psychologists dealing with the subject of influence, but also through studying records of treatment 
of recovered memory patients. Those records are revealing and devastating. Social psychologists have been studying how beliefs, attitudes, and so on can be changed through interpersonal or situational influence for at least the last 40 years. We know a great deal about this. It has been studied in the laboratory under the name conformity, attitude change, self-perception, hypnosis, role-playing, and studies of the relationship between behavior or verbalization and attributions of motives to self, one's notions about what one's, the cause of one's behavior might be. These studies have been done in every, every university in the United States. There are thousands of laboratory studies demonstrating what we know about influence and how influenceable people are. These studies are not restricted to laboratories. There are field studies that demonstrate the same phenomena over and over and over again. They study conformity, attitude change, coercive persuasion, and in my own recent area, the study of police interrogation the manner in which it is possible sometimes in a period as short as 8 to 15 hours to convince someone that it is probable that they committed a murder that in fact they had nothing to do with. We know how powerful situational and interpersonal influence can be. We know that all people are suggestible to some degree, and that some people are highly suggestible. Some people are highly suggestible, although free of mental illness. Others are highly suggestible because they are mentally ill. But we know that everyone is suggestible, and the degree of an individual's suggestibility varies with their situation. Recovered memory therapy, when looked at through the eye of someone who studies influence, and at one point was an experimentalist, and then shifted to study complex influence environments in the field, one can only conclude that recovered memory therapy is one of the most awful, impermissible experiments that one might imagine. It is nothing less than the organizing of a social environment focused on influencing and, if necessary, coercing patients, or as I used to call them, subjects, to come to believe in a personal history of horrors so extreme that few people uneducated in the literature of influence could imagine it could be done. Those of us who study influence are not in the least surprised. Those of us who have actually studied the records of recovered memory therapy treatment and have spoken with people who have been involved in it whether they still believe it or whether they have come to realize that the belief is in fact insupportable, understand easily how this is done. It amazes me that any society would ever allow such an experiment to take place disguised in the form of medical or psychological treatment. In one sense, that is the most shocking question of recovered memory therapy for me. When one studies as one must the actual process through which the behavior of verbalizing an account of a lifetime of victimization is produced, 
it becomes painfully clear how it happens. You heard part of the explanation of it this morning. The fact that getting someone to imagine something, getting someone to verbalize a narrative, winds up being stored, as far as we can tell, in the brain in a manner similar to the way in which perceived events are stored, helps us understand the biological basis for what we know to be going on by studying the behavior of it. One can study the behavior of it, chart the process, and understand it at that level even before it became possible to gain some understanding of how it worked at a biological level. What the study of the brain and memory is demonstrating is utterly consistent with what social psychologists have known for a long time. The mere repetition of a story leads one to feel comfortable with it, leads one to begin to treat it as an account that is part of one's life, which can easily become indistinguishable from real memory. It is the process of telling and retelling the story that leads to its coming to feel like and to be retrieved like a memory of any other event. It comes to be indistinguishable. Although it does not ever fully integrate with the understanding of one's life. And that's something that I will try to return to. Let me lay out a very simple influence model of what happens in recovered memory therapy. At step one, we have a patient who enters treatment primed or not. It is perhaps easier if the person is primed, but it really does not make that much difference. So the person exposed to propaganda that is readily available in this society, that if one has the symptom, this is the likely cause, may come into treatment and say to a practitioner, I think I may have been sexually abused, but am ignorant of it. Or the person may not have that idea when treatment begins. Obviously, if the person is primed, what happens next is easier. If the person is not primed, the therapist simply creates the priming within the context of therapy. The therapist trades upon authority that is enormous and cannot be ignored. Those of us who study influence recognize the enormous power of authority and especially authority that takes the form of a claim to expertise. We all, each of us, in many ways, depend on the expertise of others to get through our lives. And we are not being foolish in doing that. We cannot second guess the people who we turn to for expert advice. They are supposedly well trained. They supposedly know things that we do not. We take their advice seriously. That doesn't mean that one does not sometimes get a second opinion. But in the main, we generally do not. We turn to a dentist, an, an optician, an, an ophthalmologist, a, an internist, a car mechanic to get to real expertise. <laughs> a lawyer. <laughs> but we pose questions to them and we expect them to give us answers that are based on genuine knowledge and to tell us when they do not know. But the recovered memory therapist does not do that. The recovered memory therapist 
maximizes his or her authority by claiming, whether explicitly or tacitly in the nature of the relationship, that there is a solid scientific foundation for what I am doing and what I tell you. And that authority is absolutely crucial in understanding the decision process that underlies coming to believe in a fantasy lifetime. It is very unlikely that this would ever happen absent reliance on authority in the form of books or more likely in the form of direct treatment. Because the idea that someone could have lived a decade-long life about which they are ignorant is so out of line with human experience that one can hardly imagine someone coming to this idea without reference to some authority that says it is possible. Prior to 1985, this culture never said that was possible. Since the advent of recovered memory therapy, the culture has begun, or did begin, to say that up until, shall we say, 1980, 1992, when it all began to change. The therapist uses the authority that is inherent in their role and status in order to massively influence the patient. The therapist goes about building a link between irrelevant facts and the existence of the repression mechanism which we know does not appear to exist. What the therapist does is two things. First, the therapist works to create the facts which are then interpreted in a certain way. The therapist can create these facts, and facts are created. The facts, however, are not relevant to the conclusion that they are used to support. The facts are created through the use of hypnosis. And as we know, those of us who have bothered to read the scientific literature on this subject, hypnotically generated fantasies need have no relationship to reality whatsoever. For those of you who would like to revisit that subject, not in the context of hypnotically refreshed testimony and the mere distortion of memory of an event or the mere introduction of details that were not there until they were suggested under hypnosis, read the work of Nick Spanos. Read Spanos' brilliant demonstrations of the creation of past life beliefs through the use of hypnosis. Read Spanos' work. It is devastating to the recovered memory argument. Because Spanos shows that through the use of hypnosis, one can, one, generate the visualizations which the person does not realize are merely fantasies, but one can also lead the person to classify those visualizations as irrelevant and kind of amusing, not particularly significant, or lead them to classify those visualizations as past life memories merely by suggesting what the authority figure believes them to be. And the person who then experiences the visualization, because it is visualized, it is an experienced, it is a fact, now understands the fact in terms of what it really is, merely an interesting act of imagination or evidence of recovering a past life memory. It requires the validation of the therapist in order 
to reach that conclusion. There is nothing inherent in the fantasy that requires that conclusion. Because the fantasy resembles other imaginative fantasies that we have all experienced. When one looks at the treatment records of people victimized by recovered memory therapists, one sometimes finds evidence of the terrible struggle that the patient undergoes in deciding how to classify these visualizations. It does not happen willy-nilly. It does not happen easily. The visualizations are often as surprising to the patient as they are to the person who is ultimately accused of being the perpetrator in them. The patient, being a rational human being, initially struggles against them in all likelihood because they conflict with the patient's understanding of her or his life. This is a novelty and it is a novelty that must be classified and there is only one place to turn for that classification. It is the authoritative therapist. And the therapist at this point will either validate this fact as evidence of repressed memory or not. The therapist cannot avoid doing that, no matter what they say about not engaging in leading. The pattern is eminently clear when one looks at the records. And one, when one is lucky enough to actually get recordings of therapy sessions, it becomes frighteningly clear that often the people who say they are not engaging in leading don't have the foggiest idea of what leading really is. The therapist creates facts through hypnosis, creates facts through dreams. It is an unremarkable observation that if you drop someone into an environment, a phase of their life, in which a subject is of great importance, it is something about which they think, it is a subject about which they have an emotional response, they are likely to have dreams that reflect the concerns of their day. That is, after all, what dreaming is about. Anyone who doubts that, think about the last time you got a notice of audit from the IRS. <laughs> and about the IRS dreams that you had as the audit date approached. Were those repressed memories of earlier audits from a past life? <laughs> or did they reflect the anxiety that receipt of that notice had somehow created in you? Unnecessarily, of course. <laughs> but the dreams which occur may not even be that explicit. I can think of one brilliant recovered memory therapist who without any hesitation informed her patient that the snake that she saw in the dream obviously was the penis of the man she was engaged in convincing the patient had been sexually abusing her for years and this is why the patient's life was not perfect. Snake, penis, obviously they're the same thing. The same therapist, by the by, also helped her patient recover intrauterine memories. Put that in your biological model and smoke it <laughs> if you are trying to defend recovered memory therapy. The techniques used can produce past life memories, space alien kidnap memories, intrauterine memories they can produce 
any beliefs that the therapist wants to use them to produce. The therapist creates evidence through role playing. The therapist creates evidence through automatic writing. The therapist creates evidence by simply putting people in a position and asking them to speculate what probably happened next. And the mere filling in of that story, set in the context where it is understood what is being searched for, is enough to, to create the kind of behavioral record which ultimately, in a cumulative way, will blur one's memory of one's life by adding to it anecdotes that are integrated with one's sense of one's history of one's life. And it is that process of adding these anecdotes in and then organizing them along a single line that is recovered memory therapy. All of this step-by-step -step process, this slow negotiation of what these facts mean, how they should be assembled into a scene, into a definable moment, is the recovered memory process. And then what happens is that the scene, once assembled, built, turns into what is now labeled as a memory. It acquires that label, and once having acquired that label, that is how the person speaks of it from that point on. Because they believe it to be appropriate to call this process of fantasy building of a story a memory. And why? Because their therapists have told them that is appropriate, that is what it is. They do not forget the history generally, of how these beliefs were built. One of the interesting... Okay, speed up. I'm almost done, actually. One of the interesting things... I didn't know if I was going to have enough to say today. One of the interesting things that one discovers in this is that when questioning people who have been through the process, while they sincerely believe it, they are most of the time quite willing to tell you step by step how it happened insofar as they can remember. And sometimes they cannot remember because it was something that was revisited 50 or 100 times perhaps over a series of sessions. But generally they can tell you what the first part of the visualization was. They can actually tell you that it came to them in the form of a visualization, meaning an act of imagination with or without hypnosis. They can tell you about these things, and they're not embarrassed by it because they believe that these are valid procedures for recovering memories. And they do that because they are relying on the authority of their therapists. Having made the decision to label something as a memory, the person can now go on and begin to work on building other beliefs also labeled as memories. And that collection of facts and then that collection of beliefs labeled as memories become the history of the person's life, interwoven with the history of their life that they always knew about. And the tension between those two things is likely to be enormous, because the recovered beliefs will never take on the status of the memory of one's life. Because the memory of one's life is the residue of years of activity. It has a kind of coherence to it that the beliefs that form in recovered memory are unlikely to ever attain. In order, generally, for these beliefs to be sustained, they require constant input constant support. They are high-maintenance beliefs. They require 
a constant shoring up because they are inherently unstable. I suspect that is why we are now seeing people recanting and people returning to their families. Not because anyone has figured out how to change the state of affairs, but the fact that it is becoming known that there is another way to understand this. The fact that American society, and in this case largely through the media, has accepted that this epidemic revolves around the question of the competence or incompetence of the therapists involved in it and is now reporting that and is reporting the other side of it is creating conditions that anyone who is a social psychologist who has ever studied influence understands full well. When people are in conflict over how to judge the world and there is something that tells them what is right and there is social pressure that tells them to say something that they don't feel is correct. The presence of any reinforcement for what their gut tells them is right is enormously powerful. And I think what we are beginning to see through the change in American society's attitude towards this is the reinforcement of the doubts that people maintain about the validity and the accuracy of these beliefs that they have formed. And as people who have been run through this process come to understand that the techniques used upon them reliably confuse people, reliably make them vulnerable to influence, more and more people will reject their kind, caring, but incompetent therapists. Thank you.